Hi everybody, welcome to part 14 in the Richard Lehman novel review series and today we're talking about uh, by Lehman standards a famous or maybe infamous book of his called The Woods Are Dark, his second published novel from 1981. Got quite a bit to say about it so I'll get on with the preliminaries. Here is the cover art by Steve Crisp, an unusual one for him, you know it's not all that spooky but it does have a nice uh, evocative feel to it. And it's, I think, Lehman's shortest book. Comes in at 247 pages, but a lot of those pages are just uh, blank, blank space. Here's the back. The synopsis says, In the woods are six dead trees, the killing trees. That's where they take them. People like Neela and her friend Sherry and the Dills family. Innocent travellers on vacation on the back roads of California. Seized and bound, stripped of their valuables and shackled to the trees. To wait, in the woods, in the dark. Also on the back of this book is something which doesn't appear on any of his other books. It's a quote from Gary Branner, who wrote The Howling, uh, a roller coaster ride through hell. Lehman would later return that favour by uh, name-checking Branner in his novel The Stake. So... All right, well, this book, I described it as relatively infamous by Lehman's standards because uh, Lehman blamed this book for tanking his career in the United States. Let me explain about that. Uh, I've come prepared for this review. We have to go to this book here, The Stake, which I just mentioned. The main character of The Stake is a guy called Larry Dunbar, who is basically Richard Lehman himself. It's a horror writer in his 40s. And in this book, he gives us some insight into how bitter he was, even almost 10 years later, over what happened with this one. Uh, it says here, Larry, by the way, in this scene is trying to make notes for a new novel. And he says, where my finger is, it says, <clears throat> he's dismissing an idea she's had. Too much like the hills have eyes. Besides, I already did something along those lines in Savage Timber. That's, the woods are dark. Larry scowled at the screen. He wished he hadn't reminded himself of Savage Timber. That damn novel, his second, had nearly destroyed his career. A major release, and all it did was sit in the stores thanks to that damn green foil artsy fart cover. Don't think about it, he told himself. And if you go to this book's Wikipedia page, you can see that so-called green artsy farts co foil cover. I don't think it's that bad, honestly, and I don't think that's the reason that this book didn't sell all that well. I've also read that the editors butchered this a little bit. I'll come to that in a moment. But this was published in 1981, and apparently it was published in a very uh, abridged form. Depending on who you believe, the publishers or his editor took a lot of material out of this and in Richard Lehman died in 2001 in 2007 they discovered in his drawers in his office uh, the missing pages and published a bells and whistles deluxe edition of this book uh, a copy of which can currently be bought on eBay for a minimum of about a hundred pounds I just checked before doing this review which I am not going to pay <clears throat> and this is why now call me cynical but this book Again, I've come prepared. I have this dual edition here, The Woods Are Dark Without Other Lights. The Woods Are Dark, during Lehman's lifetime, was uh, republished. Uh, you know, new editions were put out in 1981, 1982, 1989, 1991, and a bunch of times after that. And then in this dual edition in 2006. And I just find it very difficult to believe that, considering how annoyed Lehman obviously was at how poorly this book did, if there were the missing if the missing material was to hand if he had it why wouldn't he just ask his publishers to put out the proper version of this book uh, because he was a major name in the 90s he had that type of pull i'm sure he did to do that if he'd wanted to do it like you know when stephen king added the extra 400 pages of the stand in 1990 he did that because he was able to, was successful enough to allow him to do that, and thank God he did, because that's a much better book with those pages. So that's why I'm a skeptical at first. I don't know why Lehman himself wouldn't have asked that the wrong be righted. And the other thing that makes me skeptical is, you know, turning to this edition now from five, six years after he died. Um, how credible is it that a major writer dies and it takes his estate six years to go through his drawers in his office? And 
what a mirac miracle they find the missing pages of this book. You know, after Lehman died, um, many more books of his came, which were discovered in his drawers. We got stuff like, I think, No Sanctuary, Amara, The Lake, The Glory Bus, and some of those are really good books. And we also got the uh, Friday Night in Beast House novella, which again was miraculously discovered among his notes, just as the well was starting to dry up. And then lo and behold, we get the mythical, legendary uh, deluxe edition of The Woods Are Dark, you know, the missing pages. Maybe I'm completely wrong about this, and if, if on the extreme off chance anyone from his estate is watching this, I profoundly apologise if I am wrong about that. Maybe you did just find the original version of this book all those years after. <clears throat> but uh, all I'll say is I haven't read that original version, because I, I'm sorry, but I just refuse to. As long as it's been sold for such crazy prices in these limited editions, I'm not doing that. Uh, this, Besides which, who, if people do read this book, 99.9% .9 chance this is the version they're going to be reading. And this is the version I'm going to be talking about. Because like I said, th this is almost certainly what you're going to read if you get it. So that's the introduction out of the way about the history of this novel. Uh, now about the book itself. I had read this long, long time ago, as I'd read all of Lehman's books, and I reread it yesterday, it took a couple of hours, to see mainly, is it as bad as people make out? Because this is considered to be a really bad Richard Lehman book, and there are a few reviews of this already on YouTube, and almost entirely negative. Uh, it's bad, but it's, it's not that bad. It does, it, especially the first part, is quite enjoyable. So... This book begins with Neela and Sherry, two young women in their 20s, who are driving, you know, through some Californian wilderness. And uh, on the very first page, they slam the brakes on because in front of them is, where my finger is, a legless hairy thing which dragged itself over the road with powerful hairy arms. And then it takes a severed hand on the second page and <clears throat> throws it at the girls who are in a convertible car. All right. Just let that sink in. You're driving along the road. A legless freak monster has crawled across the road, raised itself up on its torso, glowered at you, grinned at you, and thrown a severed hand into your car. They then do what any layman characters would do, which is laugh it off and go for a cheeseburger. And while they're there, I love this section here where my, where my thumb is. Uh, Nayla stretched. She gets out the car and stretches. Uh, she was stiff from the long day in the car. Standing on tiptoes, shoulders straining back, she felt the luxury of her tensing muscles. The movement pulled her shirt taut across her chest. She liked its feel against her nipples and thought how long it had been since she'd felt the eager touch of a man's fingers or tongue on her breasts. Maybe up in Yosemite she'd get lucky. Okay. Uh, three pages before, moments before, they had just met that freakish guy and now they're doing that. So, right from the beginning, you know you are in layman's hands. That's something that he was famous for, these, these very unrealistic depictions of human behavior. However, it does actually start really well. They then go to this cafe, and the, um, the owners and the other clients in the cafe turn out to be in on a ploy, whereby, let me explain the basic idea of this story then. This town is called Barlow, and surrounding the town in the woods are these creatures called Krulls. They're kind of devolved humanoid creatures. Not sure where they come from, why they're there. It's hinted at that it's something to do with a mutation, oh, sorry, radiation, but it is just mentioned once and then never mentioned again. There's a character in this called John, <laughs> we'll come to in a moment, who there's... Uh, I thought we were going to get some explanation from him. He sits down with Neela at one point, and uh, she asks him, who are the Krulls, where do they come from? But basically... His explanation amounts to, who knows? Well, John, I was hoping you would know. I thought that's why you were in the book. I thought that's why we were reading this uh, chapter, to find out who they are. But no, no one knows who they are or where they came from. They're just these creatures, and they have a deal going with the town, whereby the town trap tourists, rob them, steal their cars and sell them, and they get the people of the town get to keep all the loot. And in return, they take the kidnapped people to these hanging trees, these dead trees, and they tie them up to them. And then the crawls come and I suppose just cannibalize them. It's not really clear what the crawls do at that point, they, but they just come out and some eat them, kill them. I don't know. It's not very well described what happens after that. 
So Sherry and Neela get kidnapped from this cafe and taken to the trees. And one of the kidnappers is this guy called John. John Robbins, who becomes the hero of our piece. That is, in my opinion, the, the stupidest scene in all of Richard Lehman, because basically uh, this group of guys drive them out to the trees. They, they beat them, these girls, you know, they, they abuse them. And they handcuff them to this and then just leave them. And then John goes home and has a guilty conscience. He, he sits down on his porch and I, I, I don't know exactly where the section is. I'll let you discover it for yourself. But the, the gist of it is that he apparently he's never met a girl like this before and he's fallen in love with Neela. Right? She's not spoken two words to the guy. He's never, he's, uh, he's never, he just hasn't met her. The, the only experience he has with her is kidnapping her, helping beat her up and tie her to a tree. But apparently he's fallen in love with her. And that's reciprocated uh, hours later where he does rescue her. He goes back and rescues her. And then we get this preposterous scene here where, can you just, I ask you to remind, to remember that hours before this guy had been her kidnapper and was going to leave her for dead to be cannibalized. And that it says here, and now here was Johnny Robbins. You couldn't say he was normal, not after growing up in a town like Barlow and doing the terrible things he'd done, but he was strong and confident, he could be gentle, and he spoke straight. He was so different from those other men, so solid, someone to rely on, someone she might love. Where on earth did this come from? I know Lehman, and I've, I've kind of joked about this before, he was famous for having characters instantaneously fall in love. But even like when she's being driven to the trees, it's mentioned that this John guy in the previous time they'd done this, which was days before, had stepped on a woman's hand while this young boy called Timmy had, a rape, had abused, sexually abused her. That's your strong, sensitive, gentle guy. Ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Uh, and the ending of this book, like I said, the story isn't well explained. Who these krulls are, what they're doing, what they want why the town folk are going along with this, none of it is, it's all underwritten. And maybe in those missing pages it's all explained, but I'll never know because until the price comes down to a normal price of a book, I'm not going to read it. But the ending, it doesn't so much end as stop. It's like, remember when I did my review of All Hallows' Eve, I said that the entire book was summed up in the last page. Well, here, uh, the action is still fully going up until the last four pages two pages even. And then what we get there is we get these tiny little paragraphs which are separated by space to indicate a shift of scene. Para uh, paragraph, paragraph, paragraph. Look at that. And this is just summing up 250 pages worth of material and it doesn't sum it up well at all. And it ends with them in a car and Johnny slipping his arm around Neil's shoulders and smiling. They ride off into the sunset. And Literally on the last five or ten pages of this book, it just becomes something else. Up until then, it was a story of these creatures who were, well, basically it was The Hills Have Eyes or that film Wrong Turn. It was that kind of thing. But then at the end, it, apparently there's a monster living in the forest with huge black tentacles, which they feed people to. And this monster begins to come out of this pit. But that's all it does. It just begins to come out of the pit. So we don't really find out what it is, what it wants, what it's doing, where it came from, what its relation is to anything else that's been going on. It's just like, um, as if Lehman got incredibly bored with this story and just decided to, he thought, I can't really end this as uh, involving the Krulls because that would be boring. This is a boring book so far. So let me just throw in a curveball, a complete left turn, and somehow that'll make it a better book maybe what was he i don't know what he was thinking really don't why why suddenly it goes from being a hills have eyes type story to a lovecraftian story with none of it ever being explained with that said with that said i said it's not as bad as some people make out there are a couple of moments in this which hint at the layman that would come I loved the scene towards the beginning when this family, the Dill family, Dill's family, they check into the motel in this town, and the motel is a kind of a charade. Um, it's not re It's the cars that are there aren't real. The lights in the windows are, are. There aren't really people there. It's set up to make it look like there's people in the motel, but actually it's not. It's deserted, and they. That's how they kidnap people. And how the father of the family discovered that, I thought, was quite creepy and well done. I also loved one of the characters of this, even though it's a ridiculous character. It's a 12-year-old girl called Jenny, 
who's the most savvy and resourceful and quick thinking person in the book. And there's some very funny scenes of her like blasting people by just killing almost everyone she comes into contact with, all the bad people. Uh, she kills her stepfather. And that's the second scene that I really liked when she kills her stepfather. Um, but beyond that, there's not a great deal going for this book. It's short. That's another thing. And that's another reason why I don't really want to read the longer version. It, you know, it, this again, this isn't like Stephen King's The Stand or in films you've got like the director's cut of Nightbreed or The Exorcist 3 where it's already good and it's interesting to see what else they add. This would be like if you get the reference having bonus tracks on an album of Lou Reed's Metal Machine music. It's already tedious as hell. Why would you want more of it? And I'm sorry to be so harsh and critical of an author who I love so much, but just I have to just prepare you that this is a bad book, um, with some slightly good parts in the beginning, but ultimately it's deeply unsatisfying read. The characters are as thin as they have ever been in a layman book, and the like I said, the story just isn't all that interesting, and it doesn't end, it stops. There's a difference between ending a story and stopping it. So yeah, sorry to be so negative about this one, but I had to be because it isn't good. Uh, Richard Lehman, The Woods Are Dark from 1981. His second published book, he blames it for sinking his career in America. Um, I don't think it's to blame for that. I think that just, Amer Lehman isn't really a writer for the, wasn't a writer for the American market in the 80s and early 90s. I don't think it's any fault of Lehman's or indeed fault of America that he wasn't that famous. It's just different cultures react to different things. Australia and the UK loved Richard Lehman, America not so much, and that's fine. It's just, like I said, different, different cultures, different types of things we like. So I'll be getting back very soon with a different with another Richard Lehman book. I hope you'll stay around for it. Thank you very much for watching this review. If you did watch this far, sorry it was quite a long one. And I'll talk to you soon. Take care, everybody, and bye for now.